But friends, let's come before our God and ask for His help as we open up His Word this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, Your Word declares that the grass withers and falls off. But the Word of the Lord abides forever. Lord, we thank you for that gift of your abiding word. Your word which is as relevant for us today as it was when it was first written. Even for the human race in the future as it is for us today. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit you would cause us to understand that word this morning. That you would give us hearts that submit to it. And Lord, we into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ, the author of that word. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. As we commence our time together this morning, I ask you a question. And it's this question. Since you became a Christian... What is the one question that you have probably asked more than any other? Now, as Christians, you have probably no doubt had many questions, certain statements in the Bible, questions about the character of God, questions about what certain things mean and why certain things happen. But is there one particular question that you have asked which stands out above all the others because you have asked it more times? than anything else. Perhaps it's not going to be the same for each of us, but I suspect that for the majority of us, the answer to that question will be the same. What is the one question that we have probably asked more than any other? It's probably this one. What is God? As a believer, that's probably the question you've asked yourself frequently. Indeed, it's the question that you've probably hoped to answer by seeking counsel or advice from family or friends. In, in fact, it's the question that you have probably asked many times in prayer as you sought that answer will for my life. It's an issue that you've undoubtedly wrestled with. Most Christians go through real struggles in finding out the answer to that question. What is God's will for my life? To answer that question has been such that on some occasions I've even heard Christians say something to the effect, well, it would be just so much easier if God just sent me a letter telling me what to do. A letter that explicitly says, Christian, this is my will for you. This is what I want you to do. Have you ever felt like that? Have you even said something like that as you've tried to answer that question? Have you ever wished that same thing, that he would just give it to you in writing so that you could simply get on with the business of doing his will? Friends, as we come to today's passage in first, God has done for us. He's given it to us in writing. We have a letter from God written in black and white that tells us explicitly what his will is for us. In fact, we'll even see it in the words that he uses this morning. This is the will of God. Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as we continue to work our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to read the first eight verses this morning just to give us some idea of the will be on the first two and a half verses of this chapter. Verses 1 to verse 3a. But let's read the first eight verses together. The Apostle Paul writes, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, 
that each own vessel in sanctification and honour, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God, but in holiness. Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. You remember, friends, I'm sure from previous sermons, the context in it is written. We've seen, haven't we, in chapters 2 and 3, how Paul used those chapters to roundly defend himself against the false accusations that had been circulating in his absence. And so, for, so far, that has formed the bulk of this letter to the Thessalonians. The focus so far has been on the Apostle Paul. A totally different matter. And that's essentially what he's saying in the first few words of, the, of chapter 4 there. When he says, finally then, we read that there in verse 1. He's not, he's not signalling that he's coming to the end of the letter. He's, he still, as we can see, has much more to say. Now what he's doing is actually shifting focus. Shifting focus from himself that concerns the Thessalonian believers. And that, in a nutshell, we might say, is what is God's will for them. As a newly formed church full of brand new Christians who are probably less than a year old spiritually, what is God's will for them? And we saw and read it stated quite plainly in verse 3. Look at it again. It says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. He could have hardly have stated it any more clearly, could he? God's will for us is that we too, like the Thessalonians, be sanctified. Friends, that's going to be the the issue before us as we study this passage in God's word this morning, the issue of sanctification. I'd like to do that, but it's going to be a little different to what uh, we usually do. I'm not going to focus so much on these first three verses. We're going to use those three verses as a launching pad to look at what the scriptures say about sanctification. But we'll divide it up into two parts. Firstly, the definition of sanctification. And then secondly, the process of sanctification. How does it happen? Well, what is sanctification? It's not a word that we hear very often in our everyday conversations. It's not a word that you'll hear used on... It's not a word that is in common everyday use. So what does it mean? It's important, I think, that we take the time to carefully define what it means because almost the rest of First Thessalonians deal, deals with specific aspects of just making a general statement here. The will of God for you is your sanctification. And then throughout the rest of the book he will deal with specific instances of how that is to happen. And so because of that, if we have a faulty understanding of what sanctification actually is, we're going to have what Paul has to say in the rest of his letter. We're going to have false expectations concerning these commands that are laid before us. There's another reason why we need to have a biblical understanding of this topic of sanctification. Not because, not that also, because in some circles we can have an unbiblical definition of what sanctification actually is and that unbiblical definition can have devastating impact upon our life spiritually. If adopted, some of the incorrect views about saint despair can leave us with a sense of hopelessness in our Christian walk. In fact, some views of sanctification, if you adopt them, will appear to put you on the path to heaven, but in reality will actually damn you in the end. Wrong views of sanctification can make you lazy in your Christian walk. And so we need to get things clear. What does the Bible actually say about this issue? Like most things, we can run to the extreme in these things. 
And the issue of sanctification is no different. Take some time to focus on that issue this morning. Have a thematic sermon, so to speak, so that we get this clear in our mind before we launch into the rest of our study of this book. Having said all that then, the question still remains. What is sanctification for our lives? Let me begin by giving a definition and then we'll bring some scriptures in to to back it up. What is sanctification? In short, sanctification is the process by which we as individuals increasingly conform to the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Sanctification is the process by which we as individuals actually become increasingly conformed to the likeness. I'll put it another way. Sanctification is the process by which we become more and more holy. The process by which we become more and more godly. Sanctification is a process. Like all processes, it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. There is a time when the process of sanctification starts. There is a time when that process actually works itself out, when it actually occurs. And there is. And so, in the second part of our sermon this morning, and this is going to take up the rest of our time, the second part is that we'll look at the process of sanctification. Firstly, as I mentioned, sanctification has a beginning. It involves a change of state. Sanctification commences with a fundamental change in who we are as human beings. You see, every single one of us comes into the world as, human, as a human being with hearts that are hostile to God. Described in Ephesians 2 as spiritually dead. Dead in the trespasses and sins which are the hallmark of our behaviour in this world. We lived, Paul says in that letter, according to the lust of our flesh, indulging our desires of our sinful flesh and sinful mind as do the rest of the world. Master. It ruled over us and controlled us and we obeyed it slavishly. He says that in Romans 6. In fact, as he goes on to say in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, we were hostile towards God. We did not to his law. Indeed, we could not even do so. That, friends, is the state. That, friends, is the condition into which Each of us were born and as the scriptures make very plain, it's a condition which none of us could deliver ourselves from. We could not be godly even if we tried to. We had no desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no willingness willingness within us to be like him. Sin had permeated every aspect of our being, our desires, our emotions, our will, our thoughts, our behaviour and nothing we could do could ever bring about a change in that nature. We could never have changed ourselves. And therefore the scriptures lead us to only one conclusion. But it doesn't begin with us. The process of sanctification didn't start because of anything that we did. He couldn't. So how then did our nature, that radical change in our state before God, take place? It began when our our merciful God in the mighty miracle of regeneration, in the mighty miracle of the new birth, fundamentally changed our very nature. By his great power he transformed us into Isn't that what he says in 2 Corinthians 5.17? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
God himself does for us the very thing which he promised to do for his people. Back perhaps we'll turn to there and have a quick look at that passage. Ezekiel 11 verse 19. Notice what God promises to do for his people in this passage. He says, I, I, new spirit within them, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give, give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be. God himself takes out the stony heart that refuses to walk in obedience to him and he gives us a new heart. A new spirit, the spirit of Christ himself which enables us to walk willingly in obedience to the ways of God. We become his people, becomes our God. He sets us apart for himself. That's often the way the word sanctification is used, that idea of setting apart for God himself. You remember how the vessels in the temple were sanctified, they were set apart for God's service. Their state had been changed for now for the purpose of God. This is how sanctification begins, friends. When God fundamentally transforms our very nature, setting us apart for himself to be his people. What bearing does that truth have on the passage before us here this morning in 1 Thessalonians 4? As I've already mentioned, Paul, having exhorted the Thessalonians to press on in their obedience to the Lord in verse 1, is going to issue some very specific directives about how they ought to do this in the subsequent villain that they are to abstain from sexual immorality. We read that. He will urge them to increase in their brotherly love for one another. He will command them concerning certain matters related to to their work and their attitude towards work. He will go on to tell them what their attitude should be towards their pastors apply to us and we will look at them in detail in subsequent sermons. But it's clear, isn't it, from what we've already seen this morning that it is utterly impossible. It's not just difficult, it is utterly impossible for you to keep any of the commands that Paul will go on to express here in chapter 4 unless God first and sets you apart as a new creature devoted to his service. God must first begin the process of sanctification in you. Otherwise, any attempts at what Paul says here in verse 4 will utterly fail. And you will fail and you will fail and you will fail. And friends, I suspect that perhaps some of you here this morning already know that from your own personal experience. And perhaps it's an experience that you are experiencing now. You've tried to keep these commands. You know that you are required to obey God. You have tried to abstain from sexual immorality. You have endeavoured to genuinely love Christians. You have attempted to keep many of the others of the Lord's commandments. But each attempt has inevitably resulted in failure. You have the resolve within you to do it. You do not seem to have the will to do all the things that God commands of you. And instead of there being any real progress in holiness, instead of there being any real growth, when you look back across the course of your life so far, all you can see spiral into deeper sin and deeper disobedience. And you wonder, why is that? Why can't I do the things God commands me to do? Friend, if that describes you and you know whether that then see today the reason for that. The process of sanctification has not yet begun in you. You are not yet a new creature. You don't yet have a new heart. You have not yet been transformed by God into a man who longs to do the will of God from your heart. So I'd urge you today in the language of Scripture, seek the Lord today while he may be found. 
call upon him while he is near and he is near today in the preaching of his word. Call upon him and plead with him that he will do for his people to give them a new heart. Pray that he will begin that process of sanctification in you, that he would give you a new spirit, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the power of sin in you may be broken and that you will be finally set apart to serve the living. Because it is impossible for you to keep the commands of God until this happens. So I urge you, ask the Lord, to begin that process in you. There's a second application to be made here, which I only want to touch on briefly, but it's important that I mention it nevertheless. And it's this, if the process of sanctification begins with God, and friends, ultimately, we cannot take any credit for any subsequent subsequent process, process. Let me say that again. If the process of sanctification begins with God, we can't take any credit for any growth in holiness. If when we look over the commands that Paul gives here in the rest of the book and we can see that we have had some measure of success in obeying these commands, if we find that by keeping his will, then friends, let us remember that if we, by the grace of God, are able to do any of these things, It is because the Lord himself has first transformed us and set us apart for himself. You are in your life and you can see that there has been real progress. And it's not something you can boast about. It has only happened because in his mercy and grace God has begun the process of sanctification in you. And your boast should be in him. As we'll see later on in the sermon, we do have a responsibility to persevere in our obedience to him ultimately. He deserves all the glory for any progress that we make. As 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, that by his doing, that is by God's doing, you are in came to us our wisdom and righteousness and sanctification from God so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We've seen then which we become increasingly conformed to the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ and that process has a beginning. Let's look now at the middle aspect, we might say, of our sanctification. At the fact that sanctification itself is a process that occurs over time. You see, in our own selves we do not become instantly holy. We do not become instantly godly within ourselves the moment we become a Christian. We do not become a perfect human being the moment God makes us a new Christian. It takes time for that to happen and in fact it's a process that continues throughout our entire life. We have a hint of that in our passage this morning in verse 1. Paul urges the Thessalonians there to abound more and more to excel more and more in their obedience and has given to them in the past. Do you see that there? That Paul commends them for their present efforts. He knows that they are not yet perfect and he urges them and exhorts them to keep pressing on, to keep pressing forward in their is a lengthy process. Indeed, even Paul himself would write later in the, less, in the letter to the Philippians, in Philippians 3 verse 12, he said, not that I've already attained or be, been made perfect, but I press on. I press on. To describe this process of sanctification in the life of the believer and how it relates to the fact that we are a new creature in Christ is one that I heard uh, by Stuart Olliot. It's a great illustration that's helped me and and I trust it will help you as you seek to understand and as we seek to get our minds around about from a biblical perspective. Boys and girls, you're listening. You'll understand this too. He said, imagine a factory. 
It's a factory which has been in business for many years, but it's slowly being, being run into the ground. Productivity is decreasing. All the procedures and methods used are outdated and, and counterproductive and the staff in that factory are lazy and careless. Now, what is required to get that factory back on its feet again? Obviously, there are lots of things that need changing, but the one thing that is really going to turn that factory around, the old management has clearly failed to do what was good for that business and new management is desperately needed if things are ever going to change. Now, imagine for a moment that a new boss does indeed take over. The factory is now. There is a real sense in which that factory is a new factory. It's no longer the factory it used to be because it is under new management. But though it has new management, does that mean that business will instantly change overnight? Operating at maximum efficiency? Will it instantly be earning maximum profits? Of course not. That's going to take time as the impact of the new management is gradually felt throughout the entire factory. If we are a Christian, we are under new management. The Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are under new management, we are in effect new creatures. Our old manager, Sin, who was slowly destroying us, no longer reigns. But just because we now have a new manager, it doesn't mean that we become instantly perfect. No, it will take time as the influence of our new manager is felt throughout our entire being. Sanctification is a lengthy process. Now, why is it such a lengthy process? Why does it take such a long time for us to grow in likeness to our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's because of the presence of remaining sin within us. Sin still remains in our members. Each as we have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness, as Romans 6 puts it, nevertheless, sin is still present and it continues to affect every part of us still. It continues to affect our behaviour, our actions, our emotions, our desires, our will, everything. And it fights desires for obedience that are in our heart as new creatures under new management. And that means that not only is sanctification a lengthy process, it's a difficult process. It's a constant battle and it involves ongoing warfare against... Think about that factory again. It's now under new management. Why will there be no change in its condition overnight? It's because the influence of the old management still remains. The old in the factory. Old inefficient procedures and methods and habits are still in place. The old lazy staff still remain. As that new manager slowly goes about the business of making that factory a successful operation again, he's going to face quite a battle. He's probably going to be opposed by the staff for some time. They're going to have to learn new habits, new procedures, new ways of doing things because now a new manager is in charge. And there will be conflicts and there will be battles. There will be progress but there will be setbacks. It will be and until the whole of that factory and its staff is operating under the new management in the way that it desires. Again, friends, so it is with us. Though we have a new master, the influence of sin still remains within us and that causes constant conflicts and battles within us. It slowly gains control of every aspect of our being. Sanctification is a difficult process. You know, I'm sure, the classic passage in Romans 7 where the Apostle Paul describes that battle in his own life, in his own sanctification. Romans 7.15, what does he say? Stand. And what I will to do, what I want to do, that I don't do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. 
And then a few verses later, in verses 20 to 22 to 23, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. And yet I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me to captivity to the the wretched man that I am. But no Christian is exempt from this. This is the normal Christian life. (coughs) Sanctification is a difficult process. It is a warfare and we must be actively engaged in the fight. Now some Christians have the idea that the best way to fight this battle is simply to be passive in the whole process. That all we need to do is sit back, trust God and pray that he will suddenly make us so super spiritual that sin will no longer be a problem. Some have that view, that we are simply to, to let go and let God. Friends, that's not the language of Scripture. The scriptures constantly tell us over and over again that if we are to make progress in sanctification, we must be actively doing the things which must be in the battle. 1 John 3 3 says, We must purify ourselves as he is pure. 2 Corinthians 7 1 says, We must cleanse ourselves from every filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Romans 8 13 says, We must put to death. Hebrews 12 14 sums it up. We must pursue sanctification, that holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. We need to act. We need to be in the battle. We need to fight against sin, be actively pursuing. It's not something that's going to happen by default. We must be involved in the warfare and it's a difficult fight and it's a lengthy fight but we will find that as we do, as we seek to walk in the world, God himself will be at work within us. He will be at work within us by his spirit, strengthening us and enabling us to do the very things he commands us to do. That's the language of Philippians 2.13. You know the verse. We are in fear and trembling. They used to outwork it Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We must act, but it is as we act that God acts as well to walk in the ways of the Lord. Friends, sanctification is a difficult process. It is a battle and a fight, as I said, that we must be engaged in. But we have this encouragement that as we do those things, God himself will be at work gradually transforming us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That brings us to the third point under this second heading. Not only is sanctification a lengthy process, not only is it a difficult process, but it is, we might say, an upward process. Sanctification is the process by which month, year by year, we become increasingly more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an upward process. Now, two is implied for us in the first few verses of 1 Thessalonians 4. Yes, the Thessalonians were, by and large, actually walking in a way that was pleasing to God, just as you were doing. But what does Paul urge them to do? He urges them to abound still more. He urges them to excel still more. You see that there, they weren't to rest content believing that their present level of holiness was good enough. They must aspire to something more on towards even greater conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now friends, if we could plot a chart that measured our sanctification, measured the progress of sanctification in a Christian's life, what would we find? We would find a graph up and up as we head towards that likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that graph won't be a straight line. There will be dips. There will be falls. But the overall trend of that graph will be an upward one. When we, for a time, suffer defeat in our battle against sin. But the overall trend will be upwards, won't it? 
as it heads towards that level of perfect holiness that is found in our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why, friends, we must on the Lord Jesus Christ. His perfection is the direction in which we are headed. His holiness is the goal towards which we aim. That's what Paul said in Hebrews 12, didn't he? That we must lay aside every snares us and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's why he says in Philippians 3 verse 12, we might turn there, Philippians 3 verse 12. It says, not that I've already attained or am already perfect, but I press on, I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count my forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We can see, friends, can't we, that sanctification even in the life of the Apostle Paul is an upward process and the goal towards it is that likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We lay aside those things that hinder and we keep pressing onward and upward Sanctification is indeed an upward process. Friends, let's apply these things in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. When it comes to the commands that are in this passage, commands relating to your sexual purity, to your brotherly love, to your attitude towards work, to your attitude towards those who are over you in the Lord, indeed to any command of Scripture, what do we learn? We shouldn't expect to see perfection in these things. We shouldn't expect perfection immediately. Though in your heart you really will long for perfect obedience in these matters, in reality that is going to take some time. As we've said, sanctification is a lengthy, difficult process. You will, you will have failures. You will fall into these sins, not once, but from time to time, again and again. In fact, your fight will be a battle to walk in obedience to the commands that are listed here and that battle will continue throughout your entire life. It never ends here, this side of heaven. You'll never reach a point where you can look at these commands and say, yes, I've arrived. I now obey this command perfectly and I don't have to worry about sin in this area anymore. But friends, having said that, if you are a genuine Christian, in the work of sanctification in you, then what you will see is an upward pro- progress in the things that are listed here. You should be able to look back at any point in your Christian life, look back over the course of your life and say, yes, though I still don't obey these commands perfectly, nevertheless, I can see that I've made progress. And more like my Lord Jesus Christ in these things, I do obey these commands much more fully now than ever I used to. Friends, don't be discouraged because you still have to fight to obey these commands here. In fact, that is clear evidence that the work of sanctification is going on within you. It's actually the person who never has to fight to obey, who has to worry. Friends, if you can see progress in these matters, if you can see that slowly but surely you are becoming more godly, that you are obeying the Lord more and more in these matters and you can let it encourage you to press on as Paul says, abound more and more, excel more and more in these things. Keep striving towards that likeness, towards our Lord Jesus Christ. There's another aspect of the process of sanctification that I need to mention at this point and I really wish we could spend some more time on it but we'll only briefly look at it this morning and that is what is the chief means of our sanctification? What is the chief means through which 
Now, of course, I've already mentioned that we've been given the Spirit of God when he first began that process of sanctification. But what is the chief means that the Spirit himself uses to increasingly conform us to the likeness of Christ? The answer can be found in verse 2 of today's. What does Paul say there? He says, For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul says there that he gave these commandments issued through the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that there? Because the will of God is his commands, apostolic commands that come with the authority of God, come with the authority of Christ. And it is no different for us. The chief means by which we are to be sanctified is through the apostolic commands the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now friends, where do we see that? Where do we find the apostolic commands given through the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know the answer, it's in the scriptures. It is in the word of God. Through the prophets and the apostles that foundation has been laid. The commands that we read there which are the means for our sanctification. It's not the commandments of men. Man-made commandments won't sanctify you. Man-made laws and regulations won't sanctify you. Dare I say it, keeping Lent, it is observing the commands of God, the apostolic commands given to us in the scriptures. It is God's word that sanctifies us. Isn't that what Jesus said in John 17? Isn't that in accordance with what he prayed in John 17? Sanctify them in the truth. It is the truth of God, the commands of God that are the means, the chief means by which we are sanctified. And therefore, friends, we must be diligent to be always in the word of God. We must be diligent to know what his commands are. We need to be diligent to be with the people of God, hearing the word of God proclaimed. Word of God, they do not declare their own commands, but they declare the commands that sanctify us. They declare the truth of God that sanctifies us. Friends, that is the chief means by which sanctification happens, and it will not happen by any other commands. Well, finally, then, I feel a bit like Paul. I say, finally, then, and there's still a bit more to go, but there's not. Finally, then. We've seen that sanctification has a beginning. We've seen that it's a process that continues throughout our life. Now let's look at the fact briefly again that sanctification does indeed have an end. Coming. When the goal of our sanctification will be reached and we will be perfectly holy. When will that day be? As we've hinted already, it never occurs in this life, although some have said that it can be possible. Friends, it's not possible in this life in this life. Now, it doesn't happen until the day that we pass from this world and into glory and we enter into the very presence of Christ. On that day our very soul will be perfected and we will find verse 2. You can turn with, it, turn with me there to it if you like. I'll read it. 1 John 3 verse 2 It has not yet appeared what we shall be but we know this that when he appears, we will be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. Philippians 3 verse 20 For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he to himself. Our soul is made perfect when we die and when the Lord returns and the bodies are raised from the dead then we will be given a perfect body. Soul, perfect soul and perfect body will be reunited and we will sin no more. That day the war will be over. It will end and we will find that we have become holy human beings who are perfectly like the Lord Jesus Christ in every way. How does that old hymn go? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus 
the language of First John 3, when we all see Jesus, victory because sin has been utterly defeated within us. Friends, the fight will be over, the war will be won, no more fighting within ourselves to obey our dear Saviour. We will be like him. We will be perfect human beings created as God intended human beings to be created in perfect and that will be utter paradise for us. That will be heaven for us. The process will be complete. And there's so much more we could say about this issue of sanctification but in conclusion this morning's sermon with the statement that Paul makes in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 this is the will of God your sanctification it is indeed God's will that we be making progress in godliness in obedience to his commands now friends perhaps that sounds a little daunting for you perhaps you are overcome by the thought that you have an obligation to be ever pressing on in your conformity to Christ. That, that, that is the will of God for you. Fail. Perhaps, as I've said, you're overwhelmed by the enormity of that task. But friends, the fact that it is God's will for us shouldn't discourage us. In fact, it should be a tremendous to engage in this work It is God's will that we be sanctified. He is not against us in this task. He is not some hard taskmaster who is just itching to see us fail. He doesn't sit in heaven deliberately making it hard for us to obey because he somehow takes some secret delight in seeing us stumble. It is his will that we be sanctified and therefore we can rest assured that whatever help we need for this task, God is willing to grant it. The whole host of heaven is on our side. The great and vast resources of heaven are because it is his will that we be sanctified. What confidence we have that he will surely help us. What does 1 John 5.14 say? This is the confidence that we have in him. Anything according to his will He hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him, that we have desired of him. Friends, is is it God's will for us? We've seen it. It's there in black and white. Of course it is. And therefore, we can be sure that every time we make our sanctification a matter for prayer, Every time we call upon our God to supply us with the help that we need to obey him in all things, every time we seek his that he would make us more and more holy, we can be sure that he will. We can be sure without any doubt whatsoever that he will indeed answer that prayer. Why? Because if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We have the petition that we desire of him to see an answer to your prayers and pray that God would sanctify you. Pray that he would help you to obey him more and more and he will do it because he promises to do it. It will happen because it is his will that it happens. That you be growing in holiness and conforming more and more to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, let that truth not be a burden let it be an encouragement to you in your Christian walk as you seek to obey the commands of God. It is God's will and therefore you will have all the help 